Well, hello. Uh, at this point, we're ready for session three in the online A to Z in dental implant therapy. In this session, we're intending to begin our look at anterior implant restorations. Uh, they have unique considerations and issues that we have to look at differently than kind of our standard restoration, as we saw in our last session, the posterior implant restorations. The same keys apply uh, our awareness of aesthetic needs, our awareness of functional needs, managing the patient, being aware of, of taking care of this patient for whatever treatment length that we're undertaking. When we do all those things and we work well with our surgeons, when the surgeons understand the restorative challenges, when we understand the surgical challenges, I think we end up with a very good result. Uh, we know the techniques. We started in our first session understanding uh, the biologic potential for implant placement, for understanding the key to uh, restorative implant dentistry, which is basically taking an accurate model. When we respect those things, really the uh, dentistry becomes very straightforward, and actually we look forward to doing it. So really the bottom line uh, to effective anterior restorations, like with most restorations, is beginning with the treatment planning, the restorative case workup. The greater demand here is in finding a restoration that will solve really what's the most subjective issue, which is the patient's demands on aesthetics. What do they want to look like? How do they want to end up? Uh, sometimes you're not able to achieve those things. So can you come to an agreement as a form of negotiation with a patient where they'll accept the restoration that you can achieve, where they'll accept what they have to go through? Sometimes when you lay it out to the patient, the number of uh, surgical interventions that may be required to redevelop the bone, to redevelop the soft tissue, they would prefer a compromise restoration. Uh, not that I prefer it, but that may be something that they'll accept. If they have a low lip line, when they smile, they may not show anything but the incisal third. Do we have to put the patient through extensive surgical procedures to make a perfect emergence profile? Probably not. But we need to understand what those limitations are so that as the professional, we can make the decision if it's appropriate to put the patient through things. But like with the, uh, the posterior quadrants, I think we need to find out why that patient is in our chairs. In their own words, why are they seeking treatment? Why do they lose the tooth? Why uh, are they resistant to maybe one type of treatment? And then that helps guide us towards uh, implants. Now, one thing I've seen over the years, and I still find uh, on a day-to-day -day practice, is that some people have made up their minds that implant dentistry is way too invasive, too scary, too expensive, for them. And the reality is that uh, you know, restoring the case correctly, uh, maintaining the natural teeth on either side of the space, keeping the bone from shrinking, doing all these positive things with the dental implant is not an invasive or an, a lack of a conservation. In fact, it can be more conservative. Uh, dealing with the cost issue, it, it really is not that out of line if it's done well and reasonably in terms of a, a, a conventional bridge. It's, it's in that neighborhood if we're talking about a single missing tooth. So the outcome is so much better quite often, and, and many issues have to be addressed. But we have to deal with those things, and sometimes patients aren't honest enough to really tell us what their issues are. And so asking good questions, pulling out really what their trigger issue is, why they're there, what their issues are, I think helps us get a better final result. We need to understand each individual patient. You know, we make decisions sometimes. We walk into a room, we see a patient, we see their demeanor, we see their frown, their lack of, of smiling, and we interpret it in a certain way. But over the years, I've come to decide that I can never really tell for sure. I mean, you look at this patient and it's the happiest day of his life. Would you know that by looking at him? You would never know. And, and it's one of those things that we have to make an effort to understand why is he there, what is his issue, what is he willing to accept? Can we progress with that patient? Here's an example of, you know, I guess something that I learned from. I, I bring up cases that are my failures. At the time, though, it might have been my success. When I first did this restoration in 1986, it was close to being or was one of the first aesthetic implant restorations done in this country. It carried porcelain subgingively for the first time. This was a case we invented the UCLA abutment on. When I was putting it in the mouth, I thought it was the greatest thing I had ever done. But to see why it was a failure, you have to begin at the beginning. And basically, uh, I knew at that point, when I first met the patient, that there was no implant restoration possible for her because there was no implant component that would allow a, a restorative result. 
So I sent her to the surgeon just because she demanded it with a very ineffective note of evaluate for implants. And to the surgeon, evaluate for implant meant place implant. So he placed an 18 millimeter long implant in that site without any consideration for emergence profile. Basically, the emergence profile was the longest possible implant. And in fact, the head of the implant is actually more incisal than the emergence profile. The head of the implant is up here. We actually ridge lap the implant down to give it some uh, uh, apical length. And then basically, the case came back to me with a note ready to restore. And talk about a bit of anxiety when there wasn't a UCLA abutment, there wasn't a Procera abutment, there was no aesthetic abutments to restore the case. So we invented the UCLA abutment on that case. And then we go ahead and we make the restoration, and the day I'm putting it in the mouth, I think it's the greatest thing since toast, because I've got a tooth. The, the porcelain matches. Everything looks good. But as I'm walking in and out of the room, the husband tells me that the patient, his wife, is very unhappy with the result, and in fact is crying over it, because she's so disappointed that the cervical height of the tooth isn't the same length that the treatment partial was, which extended up to be about a line between the central and the canine, and she expected the same for the implant crown. This is a case that helped me realize how important it is to work out with the surgeon where the head of the implant is so that we can achieve the right emergence profile. So not just from a point of view of actually we had too much bone on this case. We needed to place the implant further below the level of the bone to have the right emergence profile. We also needed to place it correctly buccolingually, and this implant was placed way too far lingually to create the kind of emergence we'd like to have. So the bottom line is understanding the patient's goals, and her goal there was very reasonable here. What, you know, emergence profile, I mean, basically we probably do it automatically now, but, you know, we could look at the treatment partial and then talk about it with the patient. How do you feel about the way that looks? Is that acceptable? Where do we go from here? Another uh, uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek comment is the loss of an anterior tooth when we have a diastema. Now, some of us just assume every patient wants that diastema filled, but if we do that and we run into the patient that says, no matter what you do, you know, keep my diastema, that's, that's who I am, that can be a problem if the implant was placed in the direct middle of that, that mesiodistal space. We have to plan for the space. If we want to fill the space, we don't do it only with the implant crown. We might need to do half with the natural tooth. In fact, we need to do half with the natural tooth, half with the implant crown. So a lot more goes into it. We need to find out from the patient how they want to end up. And we don't assume that they need a certain whiteness, a certain diastema loss, even though that's the standard. Objectively, then, we do a thorough clinical exam. We're looking at the entire mouth. We're seeing what the occlusal potential is, where the guidance occurs, uh, the extruded potential of other teeth, how do we manage the case? We, do, we start with our basic periapical x-ray uh, to our panoramic x-ray to our CT scans based on each individual patient. <laughs>